The Unshackled Waves, episode 111. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have you company. Despite Christmas now almost here, the news hasn't stopped. In federal politics, we had the release of the MIEFO budget figures and a cabinet reshuffle. We have seen another tragic car attack in Melbourne CBD, and Trump scored his first major legislative victory with the passing of uh, personal and company tax cuts. We'll discuss it all with the senior editor of The Unshackled, Damien Ferry. This is The Unshackled Waves Review Show. Damien, welcome back to the show. Good to be here, Tim. Now, we had some good economic news this week with the uh, federal government releasing the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook, which is commonly referred to as MIEFO. Uh, We learnt that the uh, deficit uh, projected for this uh, fiscal year has been reduced by $5.6 billion. However, it will still be uh, $23 billion in total, and a surplus is still not uh, predicted until uh, 2020-21. And in the announcement, uh, the federal government also announced that they were going to be saving $2.1 billion uh, through higher education. There'll be a freeze on grants to universities. There'll be a cap on funding for student places. And there'll also be a lower repayment threshold for uh, students. Uh, It'll go down from 55,000 to 45,000. And they've also introduced a lifetime cap on how much students can borrow, uh, uh, which will be 104,000 for um, standard degrees. However, it'll be $150,000 for uh, medical degrees. Now, uh, this makes sense to me because there's already too many people at universities. The the Rudd-Gillard government they uh, uncapped university places. So the value of a university degree is basically uh, worthless now. And, and, you know, also add to that of universities these days, they're, you know, all full of, you know, Marxist academics and and Marxist students. I mean, all the toxic ideas that, you know, currently put forth at the moment all come from universities. Yeah, I think it's a good idea what the government did here because, I mean, anything that drastically reduces the debt is a good thing. Uh, we're, I mean, 2021 is still a, still a few years ahead of us until uh, we get back into surplus. But um, if we continue down the road and um, ensure that the Labor Party doesn't get back into power, uh, hopefully we can um, get ourselves back into surplus and um, in a better economic situation. With the universities, I actually, um, I think... Anything that reduces the amount of Marxists getting in there, or at least the amount of young people that are getting in there and that can potentially get brainwashed um, by these uh, particular topic, uh, these subjects, um, is a good thing because we need to really uh, clamp down. I mean, they, these people are, are doing courses that don't actually benefit the nation, don't actually provide any jobs, um, basically leeching um, off the system. Um, and I mean, after they go to uni, they don't find any work anyway. So they end up uh, basically on the Centrelink. Um, they they do the university uh, course just uh, for, a, you know, a good time and um, um, as, as a social gathering rather than to actually go in there and study and, and be able to um, gain knowledge and, um, and use that for a potential job that uh, can provide um, for, for the country. But... Uh, I mean, anything that reduces that would be great. And I just, um, it's just sad, the situation at hand. And and one thing I have to actually say as well is um, I've been in a bit of a debate actually lately and I've seen that the Labor Party and the Greens and people on the left have really been pushing this. Um, oh, let's uh, really push university onto our youth and, um, and get them in and um, make sure that, uh, you know, the lower educated, everybody has a chance, a uni, everybody can make it in. But the, the factor is here that they haven't really thought of is if everybody was to do what they said and then choose the university option, then who's going to be able to do all the tradie jobs? Who's going to go to TAFE and do all the certificates and all the, um, the, the, the courses and things that, that university doesn't provide? 
uh, you, you're going to have a very big um, downfall in, in um, certain industries um, that aren't covered and that don't have the, the workforce. And then you're going to have too many pen pushers in offices, and um, which is going to lead to a big unemployment rate because a lot of people are going to go and apply, for, um, do the same courses in, in, in university. And when they go out of university, they're all going to be applying for the same jobs and the jobs aren't going to be there for them. Um, they're not going to exist. There's going to be too many workers and too less jobs. So, and, and then there's, on the other side of things, there's going to be a lot of jobs, um, but not enough uh, workers that are qualified for those jobs. So the, the whole push for people to be forced into uni or, or really um, the, this whole mentality of our kids really need to go to university, it just, to me, doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, Labor and the Greens, they've still got this snobby attitude that, oh, if you, you know, don't go to university and uh, uh, go into a trade instead, you're, you know, somehow, uh, you know, dunce, you'll be, you know, living in, uh, you know, the, the working class doldrums. And it's, it's just really, uh, you know, dreadful, you know, how they sort of view these professions. And we are suffering uh, a trade shortage shortages at the moment that's why uh, there's been so many uh people coming in on four five seven uh visas and you know mm. uh, just because uh, and you know just because it doesn't require a university a degree doesn't mean it uh it, it doesn't pay well i mean a lot of these tradies they earn you know six figure salaries uh many of them are successful uh businessmen like that's where the you know real a real money is like um you know, you, you may sneer at, you know, kids who drop out of school at 16 to go for a trade, but, you know, they're, at the moment, they're the ones laughing all to the way to the bank. Oh, I, I'll tell you one thing. I don't regret not going to uni. Um, I actually would have dropped over to 16 if I actually looked back on things because, like you said, it's, um, it really is... Um, there, there, there really is a uh, a change in the workforce now. I mean, back in the in, in our parents' time, uh, the tradies and uh, people that did these kind of roles were really getting paid uh, peanuts. They were on the, the lower end of things um, when it came to wages. But these days, a lot of tradies, um, if not most tradies, earn six-figure sa uh, salary sums. I mean, they get a lot of money. And um, also, the fact is that because there isn't uh, many wanting to do the trade um, courses and, and qualify as tradesmen. Um, that also affects consumers because without not being as much competition out there, the prices are through the roof when you actually need something done for your home, uh, need renovations done or whatever it else it is. Um, because there's not many people doing the job, they can charge a lot of money for it, which uh, then ends up the consumer having to cop it too. So um, it really isn't a benefit to anybody. I mean, we really need a healthy mix and balance here. And um, I mean, university students, they're lucky when, if they do get a job once they come out of university, um, they normally earn just a very mild wage, maybe 40, 50 grand if they're lucky to start. And um, then they have to work their way up. And I mean, they've got that debt to pay off before really um, having to be able to save up for anything. So, I mean, um, it's not really the lifestyle that I would think is the smart option. I mean, just looking at it personally um, and for them to push it as the ideal um, ideal way, really, uh, it, it doesn't seem like the, the, the left have the, the best interests at heart of, of, um, of young people. And the other area of savings that was announced is that uh, new migrants will now have to uh, wait an extra year for uh, welfare. It goes from three to four years. Now, most people are of the opinion that, you know, if people are going to migrate to Australia, uh, you know, they, sh uh, they should, you know, prove that, you know, they're not going to be a, a drain on the uh, tax system that they haven't uh, paid into. Uh, but... Yeah, if I I just wish, and a lot of other people do that. You know, it applied to you know people like you know refugees and asylum seekers who you know get welfare, which is in excess that than what's available to Australian citizens. Yeah, that that, that is something that really needs to to uh, be looked at because I mean, there's a lot of people that come over here and they really abuse um, our system. I mean, um, our governments really are. Um, stupid to allow this to happen um so really i mean is it the fault of the people doing it well it's more the fault of our leaders that are allowing them to do it because i mean 
most people given the situation will do the exact same thing if they could take advantage of something and it is legal and, and everything i mean if they could um do that then why wouldn't they so i mean our leaders really need to step up and think well i mean we have um a, a big big amount of unemployment um australians here out of work we keep on bringing people from overseas over here i mean many of them um third world countries and many of them aren't even safe and um, have violent uh, histories and whatnot. And I mean, just even disregarding the, 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 the culture or, or where they come from. I mean, if you even look at it just based on economics, it just doesn't make sense because I mean, you haven't got the jobs here um, and the amount of people that keep on coming over here, you're either going to get a situation where they're competing with Australians for the jobs that are available or um, they're just going to end up on the welfare list and it's just going to cost us a lot more money. Malcolm Turnbull announced a cabinet reshuffle this week. Uh, one of the worst uh, kept political secrets was revealed that Attorney General George Brandis is now uh, off to London to be Australia's uh, High Commissioner. Um, uh, it's fair to say that he uh, definitely uh, won't be missed, especially him, you know, crying about you know Pauline Hanson's burqa and uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, his replacement, Christian Porter, uh, the new Attorney General, he's uh, uh, said that he ideally would like to abolish the, the Human Rights Commission, uh, but realises that he probably can't do that. So he certainly made a, a good start. Other minor tweaks are uh, Michaela Cash. Uh, she b- bizarrely stays. Uh, she's now Minister for, well, not employment, but for jobs and uh, innovation since uh, Arthur... Uh, Zinedinus has now permanently stepped away from uh, Cabinet to uh, fight cancer. Yeah, it seems like some interesting um, things that have taken place within the government. I mean, um, George Brandis uh, going off to a um, a nice cushy role um, seems to be uh, seems to be something that um, many end up doing from time to time. I I just um, it just seems very strange when it comes to the timing of this. So I was actually really thinking of this, and I thought to myself, isn't it funny that George Brandis, um, one of the the biggest uh, same-sex marriage supporters um, after he ends up winning the vote that he all of a sudden quits parliament as if to say oh, okay my job is done now you know I've got what I wanted now I'm moving on um, just as if like he was really um, there or in parliament for one particular purpose and um, he's got a nice cushy role now definitely won't be missed I mean the way he ended up uh, crying over the the, the, the saga with uh, Hanson with the burqa and and also with um, with the same sex marriage, um, saying it was a very personal issue for him. It just um, it really seems to me that he wasn't someone that was a genuine liberal. Um, he was uh, definitely more left leaning. Christian Porter is is a good choice for the role as Attorney General. I'm actually surprised that Turnbull made such a decision because he tends to um, give uh, roles more towards um, his mating party rather than people with opposing views. But abolishing the Human Rights Commission, I mean, uh, that's a great great step even mentioning such a thing. Yeah, Brandis, uh, I mean, uh, uh, he turned out the uh, same way as, you know, Christopher Pine. I remember when, you know, Tony Abbott was opposition leader and then prime minister, they were, you know, at the forefront of these, you know, conservative battle. I mean, George Brandis, he, you know, led the the campaign to, you know, have uh, 18C uh, reformed, you know, was uh, big on free speech. But yeah, like ever since Turnbull taken over, um, he's gone down this, you know, leftist road where, you know, it's, re- it's really about, you know, the, um, you know, virtue signalling on, you know, Islam or whatever whatever other um, progressive issue. It seems to me that perhaps he was never conservative to start off with and he was actually being fake when he was under Abbott. I mean, that's the kind of uh, feeling I get with it because if he was to quickly change his ways or his views, his ideology, uh, once Turnbull takes place, as if to say, oh, you know, I can let my hair down now, I'm comfortable, I can start to um, really be who I want to be, so to speak. So under Abbott, he must have been a fake. Um, you know, like he, he, he definitely spoke the right way and, and fought for the right issues, but it seems he didn't deliver in the end because he's really changed and backflipped on him. 
But of course, the the biggest shakeup uh, in the the cabinet was in the uh, national uh, party's positions. Uh, infrastructure Minister uh, Darren Chester, uh, he was dumped from cabinet completely, and uh, Barnaby Joyce uh, has moved from agriculture to take up infrastructure. Uh, who, uh, the person that's taking over is infrastructure. Uh, sorry, Agriculture Minister now, David Littleproud. Uh, he's only been in Parliament uh, 18 months and he's going straight from the, the backbench to ca uh, Cabinet. So this has been you know, quite stunned uh, a lot of people. Uh, Bridget McKenzie, uh, she, uh, she was recently elected a Deputy Leader. She uh, goes from the backbench into Cabinet, but obviously you know, since she was elected you know, Deputy and she's uh, been in the Senate uh, uh, since uh, 2011, she's certainly got a lot more experience. Now, uh, we were told that the reason Darren Chester was dumped uh, was uh, simply on, you know, geography, because uh, Bridget McKenzie had to go into Cabinet. She's also from Victoria, and so somebody from Victoria had to go. Um, so it was uh, Darren Chester. But uh, there was an alternative narrative uh, th uh, th uh, that was spelled out that um, it was uh, payback from uh, Barnaby Joyce because in the national deputy leadership ballot, uh, Darren Chester did the numbers for Bridget McKenzie. Uh, wh when Barnaby Joyce, he wanted uh, Matt Canavan, uh, who is currently the Northern Australian minister, to be elected uh, deputy. And so it's really these tensions in the National Party that nobody knew existed last week have now suddenly uh, j uh, just basically burst out this week and uh, if, you know, it's all, all the turmoil has been in the Liberal Party for most of this year but now it looks like yeah, the National Party they could be you know just as bad yeah, It seems politics as usual really it, um, they just can't stop themselves when it comes to infighting and people trying to tear themselves down and, and be in certain positions and um, it, it, it really is a sad case uh, David Littleproud is a surprise, but he was one of the few conservatives actually that voted no to the same-sex marriage uh, plebiscite. Um, well, well the, the the when it was brought to parliament, he voted no. Um, he was only one of the few, uh, whereas a lot of them ended up abstaining instead. So he's definitely someone that has convictions. I have to give him that. And the Nationals really have to get their act together and start basically representing country people again. I mean, a lot of them have, have gone down uh, left-wing leanings in, in many states, apart from perhaps Queensland, that they're, they're still retaining a little bit more of the conservatism. So they really need to start re uh, representing the people because otherwise, if they continue down this road of infighting, division, uh, not only will they fall apart because they will be replaced by other parties or, or independents, because people in the country you can't mess with. In the CBD, in, in, the, in the suburbs, people tend to vote for the majors, but out in the country, they, they're a lot switched on and they can vote independent or for smaller parties like the Shooters, Fishers, Farmers, One Nation, um, a range of different, the Conservatives, a range of parties like that. Uh, they definitely have a shot because of the, uh, the amount of damage that the Nationals are doing to their brand. You would think that Barnaby Joyce, uh, you know, since he had to go to that, you know, by-election uh, because uh, he was revealed to hold dual citizenship, when he returned to Canberra, he might be a bit more uh, humble. But you know, he's really, you know, have come back, you know, wanting to throw around his, you know, political authority because it's a, it's a, you know, it's a pretty, you know, brutal political act to, you know, dump, you know, somebody like Jaron. Darren Chester from cabinet, um, you know, co uh, completely, and it's it has raised. It's not just Darren Chester who's displeased. There, there was another uh, demotion, Keith Pitt uh, from Queensland. He's, um, you know, uh, now threatened to uh, sit uh, a as an independent uh, as well. And so there's, you know, been questions about Barnaby Joyce's. Um, you know, judgment, uh, as as we know um, from what we've read in the papers, you know, like Barnaby Joyce's, you know, personal life is in a in a bit of turmoil. You know, it could be, you know, all the all the uh, you know leadership speculation has been about Turnbull this year, but who knows? Yeah, twenty eighteen, there could be a a spill in the National Party. Uh, definitely could be something going on there, and the they 
can continue on in this way and they're only going to damage themselves. I mean, they, they really need to start sitting down, working together, choosing the best people for the role despite all of the um, past history that uh, someone may have a uh, grudge against another particular person for a personal issue or anything else. Uh, they, they need to pick the right people for the right team to, to lead them. And I mean, people have to know where, where they stand, what kind of um, experience or what role they bring to the party and know that not everybody can be leader or deputy leader, that it has to go to the person that does the best job at that particular role. And unfortunately in politics, everybody wants to be the boss. And that's why they'll do anything to tear somebody down just to get their spot because of the money factor and also because of the power factor. It's very sad that that's the way it works, unfortunately. And I mean, for the sake of the people, hopefully these, these politicians can start to have a little bit more values and, and start to be there for the right reasons, which is to represent us. There was yet another car attack in Melbourne's CBD. It is the third one this year. It happened uh, at a busy intersection at Flinders Street and Elizabeth Street. Uh, there is uh, 19 people in hospital at the moment, uh, four are in a critical condition. Uh, the person who was driving the car is a, was a 32-year-old uh, Afghan refugee who arrived uh, in Australia in 2004. There was a 24-year-old uh, uh, man who was uh, taken into custody. Uh, he was filming the incident and there was knives on his person. However, police have said he uh, doesn't know the driver and has um, uh, nothing to do with the, uh, the act. Uh, now, the uh, official line from uh, the police and the government is that it was a, a combination of mental health and uh, drug abuse because the, the suspect, uh, he was on a uh, mental health plan uh, and uh, he was an ice addict as well. However, uh, when he was taken into custody, he did uh, have mutterings that, you know, he was doing this because of the Australian government's uh, persecution of uh, Muslims. Now, uh, a lot of people, you know, because you know, it's the third one this year, there was the, obviously the Burke Street attack in, in January, which uh, killed six people. And then there was uh, uh, people overlook it because thankfully no one was hurt. There was one on uh, grand final day, a, a, a car rampage uh, by a, fi a 15 year old. Uh, you know, so, as, so, you know, now the public, you know, they're angry. They're, you know, they've had these bollards, you know, rolled out in the, the, the CBD and yet it seems to be coming, you know, disturbing, you know, trend in Melbourne. Well, those bollards were a waste of money, a big waste of money, because in the end, the people that want to do these kind of attacks just choose a different area where the bollards aren't there. I mean, it's it's quite easy to do so. I mean, there was no bollards put in every single spot on the street. And you wouldn't want that anyway because it just defies any any purpose. It kind of encourages it. I mean, when, when the government is going all out trying to uh, uh, resist attacks, I mean, you're, you're pretty much, in, in a way, um, call, calling these, these attacks uh well you're saying to these people these extremists oh look you know we're we're doing everything to try and uh stop you you know try trying to egg them on i mean they don't work the bollards don't work they're a waste of money they don't do anything the the attackers need to be brought to justice there needs to be something done daniel andrews is is never going to do anything about crime in victoria he's hopeless he's you've seen it with the with the sudanese uh, apex gangs, you see it with the continual attacks, these, um, these kind of uh, driving attacks that the, the people are just getting run down. And these are innocent people. It's, it's not as if this person had a, a grudge or anything um, to do with any of the particular people. He just picked at random. So you're in the, in the, in the city, you're, you're with your family, wrong place, wrong time, you could die. I mean, this is uh, the situation we're in now. It's very scary. People are going to be, you know, afraid to go outside and, and go to the CBD. I mean, it's going to have consequences. I mean, shops are going to lose business over it. Um, there's just such a, a great effect. But if, a, if this 24-year-old who filmed the incident is actually proven to be uh, somebody that is connected with the suspect, 
then one could basically say that the suspect did it knowingly and planned if there was somebody there filming the incident and they couldn't really use the drug um issue well as they a did defense, say it couldn't... was a deliberate mm. act i mean that was one of the the first uh, yeah. bits of information to 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 come out so you know we are dealing with uh, you know, a person who had some sort of motive. Now, uh, you know, a, a lot of people have said, you know, call it an act of, you know, Islamic terrorism. Like, you know, he talked about, you know, persecution of Muslims. But at the very least, it's, you know, a failure of, you know, our immigration system. I mean, he was a refugee from, you know, Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, you know, it looks like, you know, uh, once again, we've, you know, um, you know, enjoyed, you know, the, the cultural enrichment, you know, that uh, that brings. Uh, and of course, uh, as you mentioned just before, you know, Victoria is dealing with, you know, the, the consequences of lax immigration. And uh, where we learned this week that it's not just the, the Apex gang, um, because there's been a number of uh, youth rampages in Melbourne's western suburbs. There's actually a new uh, youth African game called uh, Menace to Society. They were responsible for the trashing of a, of a house in Werribee. And it's quite ironic that uh, uh, one day before that uh, this tragedy happened in Flinders Street, Victoria Police, you know, defended uh, their, you know, presence in the city, saying, you know, we're not soft. And, you know, boy, like, you know, within a day, that you know, that didn't age well. And the, the, the Chief uh, Commissioner, uh, uh, Graham Ashton, he's not actually doing his job at the moment. He's away on uh, stress leave. I mean, so... Uh, you know, Victoria doesn't even have, uh, a ch at the moment, it's the assistant commissioner that's, you know, doing all the uh, media and that. And uh, 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 it, just, it just looks like there's, you know, just no willingness of, you know, at the both the government and police level because, you know, these ramp you know, you know, rampages during the week by these, you know, African youths, there were no arrests made, you know, so basically... Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, you know, a lot of, you know, Melburnians are now, you know, feeling under siege. That's, that's exactly right. And, I mean, they're getting a slap on the wrist when they're committing such terrible acts. Of course they're going to. Why wouldn't they? They, they know that they're going to get away with it. I actually seen uh, documentaries on TV about this, and they went up to these guys and they asked them, oh, you know, um, what do you think about um, the consequences or, you know, and, and they basically said outright, oh, we're not going to get caught, nothing's going to happen. Like, they were so confident that they were going to get away with it. And when the uh, presenter then asked, oh, what happened if the government ended up being strict and clamped down on it? this? They said, oh, well, we wouldn't do it anymore. They, they actually were so honest. Like, they, they were like, yep, you know, if this happened and the government started... Um, getting their act together, yeah, it wouldn't be good for us, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to do what we do now. So, I mean, what else do they need when the criminals are actually coming out and saying, um, telling them how it is, just um, they're, they're still ignoring it. And I mean, we um, actually had uh, Imam Tahidi uh, do a video clip on, on social media about this. And he was really uh, critical about the way the government was treating this situation how soft they were, and he actually went to um, to extremes in, in some people's eyes that he was saying that the only way to solve such an issue is to bring back capital punishment. Um, and, I mean, he was... A lot of people can sympathise with it because they're looking at it and they're thinking the system isn't here protecting us innocent people. They're allowing these things to happen, and when they do happen, the people aren't getting prosecuted for it, and they're getting nothing, you know, like they'll, they'll claim um, a mental illness or, or whatever the case be, and they just end up getting away with it. They need tougher, tougher ways to deal with these people. Uh, and let's not forget he had a criminal history as well. He was convicted mm. uh, of assault in, uh, back in 2010 and he just recently, uh, you know, been arrested for, you know, driving uh, without a licence. So, you know, it, it's, 
I predicted, like, as soon as this tragedy happened, that, you know, he would be known to police somehow. You know, that, that that's how it always is, you know, despite that, you know, we have to give all of our, you know, metadata to the to the government now. Like, when something like this does happen, uh, it, it's always, you know, the, the authorities knew and, you know, have, you know these people, they're always, you know, a ticking time bomb and yet, uh, look what happens. Oh, no, it's such a sad situation. I mean... It's it's really destroying the community. It's it's destroying the spirit of the community. It's um, making people have no faith in the politicians that are there to to enact laws to try and protect us. I mean, it, it, it's such a bad situation, and there's, there's people really raising questions as to how to deal with this. And I mean, why are we even bringing these people here in the first place? I mean, this is this is the kind of situations. There's there's so many times where you can say it's a one-off incident, but when you continue to have these people, whether they're Sudanese, whether they're um, Middle Eastern immigrants that come here and, and end up committing such acts, or even, I mean, acts that are not even terrorist attacks, but they um, that could be uh, break and enters or, you know, uh, violent. I mean, we saw a lot of them at the Milo protests that got involved and then were throwing things, at uh, bottles and everything at, at the policemen. So they're really having an impact and causing so much havoc in Melbourne in particular, and they're taking advantage of a very weak left-wing government that knows, they, these people know that a government of such sort isn't going to do anything and they're going to be soft on crime. Well, Malcolm Turnbull didn't do much better at his press conference today. He said, you know, yes, he was a refugee, oh, but he didn't arrive by boat. He came through our official tra- travel. So, yeah. um, you know, that, that that's supposed to be okay. That that actually, you know, makes it worse because, you know, the the government's, you know, immigration vetting process, you know, didn't pick up, you know, that this, you know, guy was, was going to be trouble. So how can we be sure that, you know, the ones that the immigration, you know, department are vetting at the moment, you know, the ones coming from Syria and Iraq are not going to, you know, cause us problems down the road? Exactly. And I mean, why, what, what reason did he have to come here? Was he working in a particular field? Did he actually uh, get a job and, and was um, successful in what he was doing? Uh, did he provide to the community in, in any sort of way or was he just a economic refugee that came here for the lurks and perks and basically tried to um, rip the system off and, and with his own ideology and, and extremist thoughts, uh, took matters into his own hands and um, decided to enact such a situation. I mean, they, these people uh, are not supposed to be coming here in the first place. Anyone that that does come to this country has to be extremely vetted in such a way that they are going into work and that they, at the same time, not taking work off unemployed Australians that could be doing the same work. I mean, they really need to be filling in positions that economically can't be filled if they're niche positions that are particular, um, that the particular people couldn't fill and they had to come here and, and fill that position. But I mean... They, they don't do any benefit for us. They're, uh, they're, they're a strain on the system when it comes to financially. They're a strain on the system culturally when they come here and they and they try and enact um, and push their ideas on, onto everybody else and, and take such violent actions. Um, they're really a, a plague on society in general and the government needs to stand up at all levels, um, the state, the federal government. They all have to look at this and say, We should be looking after our citizens first and not bringing people from overseas that have a sob story um, to try and give them a better life when they're not going to be appreciative of it. The United States President Donald Trump had his first major legislative victory with the uh, legislation through both houses of Congress of uh, income and company tax cuts. So the top rate of tax was reduced from 39.6% down to 37 the middle income brackets from uh, 28 to 24 percent, lower uh, income brackets from 25 to 22, and the lowest one from 15 percent to uh, 12 percent. And the corporate tax rate will uh, go down significantly from 35 percent to uh, 21 percent. So pretty much uh, everyone's uh, a winner here. And in this age of uh, corporate uh, virtue signaling, uh, companies uh, quickly announced that they were uh, passing on the the tax cuts to their workers in the forms of uh, bonuses and uh, increased uh, uh, minimum wage, which uh, uh, 
would definitely have the effect of, you know, maybe changing a few workers' minds on um, there are these tax cuts. So, yes, it is. Uh, oh, they're, they're saying that this is the, the biggest tax reform uh, uh, since uh, Reagan did in the, in the 1980s. And, um, yeah, it's certainly... Um, you know, because uh, Trump is is always you know get, gets into trouble for you know something every week, and you know even uh, you know even like the the mainstream media are saying you know what a victory you know this is like you know Paul Ryan even said you know uh, what great leadership you know Donald Trump did so uh, it's it, it is really you know riding high and um, yeah at, at last you know not on the defensive. Yeah, it seems like uh, he's doing really well in his victory that he's had and um, a lot of people are praising him for it because of the benefits that it's going to have to a lot of people uh, across the field from the, the high, middle and low income um, recipients. So, I mean, it's uh, it's something that can really benefit. And I think that a lot of people are, are shocked with the big uh, deduction in the corporate tax rate. But in saying that, um, a lot of people then can say that it will encourage businesses to want to stay in the US rather than going overseas because of the, the tax rate going down so much. So it really can benefit um, in keeping companies in the US. Um, obviously, uh, workers being better off in having to pay less of tax and um, getting bonuses in their wages. It's... Um, regulations being cut in general it's it's uh, something that can really affect the economy in a great way yeah uh you know trump the the economy has you know grown significantly you know um hundreds of thousands of jobs have been added uh and you know it's uh, during this year he also sent out a directive to uh the bureaucracy that um for every new regulations that uh, that that's enacted uh two must be cut so if you combine this tax cut with you know cuts uh, in regulation, as we know how much the the regulatory state has you know grown in you know recent years, he's actually setting the conditions for you know a pretty significant uh, economic recovery. As we remember the you know economy, it was so slow to you know pick up after um, during the Obama years, uh, and so you know people may get you know offended by you know what he says on you know Twitter, um, but you know. If, in Americans' daily lives, it's actually, you know, getting better unless, of course, you know, you're a snowflake when you're, you know, you're probably in the fetal position every time, you know, the, the president says something. Yeah, well, Tom will tell how it actually, um, how it affects the economy and just how um, the benefits end up um, getting passed down throughout the system. So we'd have to keep an eye on it and just see how um, how it really is working for people. I'm sure they're going to be able to go on the streets and ask people their thoughts and, and try and um, get the thoughts of the companies and, and, and see if it will change people's mind. Um, anybody that wants to uh, perhaps um, go, to, go to another country to do business or um, uh, because of the particular economic circumstance that was happening and um, be able to um, provide an incentive to, to keep them here, to keep the work here. It's it's something that um, will be interesting because you don't see uh, this kind of reform happening um, very often in 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 modern society. I mean, it's not like such a it's such a big change. So we'll have to really um, see how it all goes. Uh, a lot of the discussion in in Australia has been should you know we do the same. Uh, obviously, the uh, the Turnbull government they've legislated a reduction in uh, co uh, company tax uh, down to twenty eight point five percent, but our pers uh, the highest personal income tax bracket or well, it was at forty nine percent if you include all the uh, you know levies. Um, they they did. Um, in the in the last budget, get rid of the debt levy, which brings it back down to uh, forty seven percent. But um, you know, obviously, the you know Labor Party, you know, they they're vowed to you know reverse these uh, you know ta tax cuts if they get into office. So it certainly looks like, and you know, given that the government's hamstrung by big government parties in in the Senate, that Australia's going to be left behind. I mean, uh, United States they now have a corporate tax rate which is on par with you know Singapore, which uh, has a has around uh, 20%. So, you know, uh, 
it, it's really going to make us you know economically you know uncompetitive and let's not let's not even bring into the fact that you know our renewable energy policies are raising the um the the price of energy you know sky high i mean you know we're really in a bad place in australia for you know investment and uh you know giving business certainty uh renewable energy is a joke I mean, um, the amount of money that people have to fork out for that, which does little to improve the environment whatsoever. Um, it, it actually, I, I was just thinking whether um, some of the companies that we used to have, especially in the in the car industry, whether those kind of companies would have maybe chosen to stay on rather than, um, than go overseas, whether um, I, if we had taken such an approach, you know, like it's... Um, it's worth thinking about that, that we could still perhaps have such industries here in Australia if the government chose to go down this path. Yeah, and while, while you mentioned that, uh, uh, one of Trump's promises was to, you know, keep jobs in America. And uh, remember when, yeah. you know, in his first few months of presidency, there was a lot of, you know, companies saying, you know, we're going to, you know, stay in the United States. We're actually going to open up a new uh, plant here. And so, you know, United yeah. States is really... No, uh, the industry is coming back and yeah as you mentioned you know we've seen our you know car um industry leave uh, and you know who knows uh, uh what, what what else will go on in the future i mean uh, we're just so you know uncompetitive yeah, that's true uh, i mean um, it's really sad to see the situation what's happening here and i uh, i guess it was happening overseas as well and trump's um, seen this as a, as a way of being able to fix the situation and um, time will tell how well it fixes it and we can maybe learn from this and, and just see how it changes things in the US and if everything goes well then uh, perhaps the government can take such an approach down here. Um, I mean it, it would be very difficult for the left to argue um, against it if it was so successful overseas so once uh, we get an idea of how it works and how everything is going through the system overseas, then in Australia people will be able to get uh, more of a um, more support for such a for such a, a change and then people opposing it would then really not have much of a i mean they would just have to uh, virtue signal and um, and say your usual oh, the the poor people will be lesser off and you know and blame, you know they basically use the particular um, groups of people to their advantage and say, oh, you're going to be worse or off and, you know, use it as an election issue. You're going to lose this much money and that. that. But, I mean, th th this is the particular things that they that they always speak about. They always tend to um, um, tell people how worse or off they are and ju just to a, a negative kind of um, uh, negative vibes throughout the community that don't help at all. And rather than actually acknowledge when, when things do right, I mean, the Labor Party aren't ones to come uh, to the table and say, oh, well, you know what, um, initially we were against this, but it seems to have worked, so we're going to support it. I mean, they're not, they're not a principled party. They're, 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 they're very stuck on, on ideology rather than um, what works for the country and what's actually benefiting the community. Uh, certainly, Australia needs to uh, get us act together uh, economically in uh, 2018. Uh, but as always, uh, Damien, I enjoy your analysis. So thank you for coming on the show again and have a, a merry and safe Christmas. Thanks for having me, Tim. Merry Christmas to all and um, we'll be seeing you very shortly. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. A Merry Christmas to you all, and don't forget to vote in our 2017 Unshackler Awards. There are 10 awards with 10 nominees each, with the winners determined by a poll of our followers and announced on Australia Day. So far, both the Regressive of the Year Award and the Patriot of the Year Award categories have been posted, so make sure you get voting. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you after Christmas. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.